This panel, if I may say so, is a once occasion. Um, that we have brought these marvelous composers. Yes, exactly. <laughs> that Robert Ashley, Gordon Mama, uh, <coughs> Roger Reynolds, and Donald Scavarda have all agreed um, to uh, pitch themselves here and pitch themselves into presentations is something that we should be very <laughs> proud to be part of, if I may say so. This morning we had uh, a symposium after last night's magnificent concert. Um, thanks to Michael, if I may say so. Um, if, um, th this morning we had a symposium about um, uh, Robert Ashley, um, Gordon Mumma, Roger Reynolds, Donald Scavarda, some of the other once uh, festival composers, also Cage and Tudor. This afternoon we um, get to hear um, uh, these composers uh, these four composers frame the experience of the past, the music written in the past, the sense of career, the trajectory of that music in their words, in their way, according to the <coughs> narratives that they wish to tell us about the experiences of creation and participation and performance that we are lucky to have as a legacy. And those narratives, uh, well, I'm just thrilled that we're going to have them, actually. Um, the way we're going to proceed is we will have the four composers each speak for about 10 minutes, present for about oh, 10 I minutes. I my score. Oh, OK. I'll, I'll still be talking when you come back. Don't worry. <laughs> Um, it comes naturally. <laughs> so um, uh, we'll have 10 minutes each um, in which we'll uh, have their presentations, their narratives, and so forth, followed by, I think, Michael will take over and maybe uh, set a couple of questions and have a bit of conversation. Then, of course, after a, a, a quick amount of time, we're going to open it up to everybody. There's incredibly interesting people here, people who are writing books on some of these composers, exhibitions, other composers, people in the humanity, all kinds of people, musicologists, and so forth. So it'll be a great as soon as Robert Ashley comes down with his score, we're going to start with him. Okay. <coughs> so please let us welcome uh, Robert Ashley, Gordon Muma, Roger Reynolds, and Donald Scavarda. Thank you very much. in the middle somewhere between loud and quiet. I'll speak normally. The problem we've been having, I mean, what we've been thinking about for a long time is that after he had his stroke <laughs> and he could just nod his head and move his hands a little bit, he had a young girl, a pretty one too, come in to take care of him. And after a while, to pass the time, I guess, they worked out a plan. God, I don't know how, that she would read the dictionary aloud. <laughs> I mean, just one word after another. No definitions or anything. Just the word, and then on to the next, and he would nod his head or move his hand if she read the right word. <coughs> and she said they had to go through the dictionary a lot of times to get the words in order. <laughs> but she didn't mind because there was nothing else to do. And he seemed to really like it. I mean, she would read a word, and he wouldn't nod the first or second time, she said, or even the third time until she got the idea that he was making a sentence. And so they finally got the words in order. And what the sentence said was, thank God I figured it out. Naturally, We've been wondering if it had anything to do with the stroke 
I mean, if the stroke came because he figured it out or if it was just a coincidence, which we will never know, I guess. And we wondered, too, what it was he meant. <laughs> I mean, what he got figured out. After the sentence, it got easier, she said, and quicker, and they started doing other things, things like this. <laughs> but when it kept getting bigger, somebody said, you wouldn't think you could even live long. Oh, trapped up like that, much less keep doing something in your mind. And somebody else said, yeah, well, he's got nothing else to do. And somebody else said, that girl is smart. Maybe she did the whole thing. And the girl said, no, she couldn't take credit for that. She said it was all in the old man's head. And she just got so she could see it quicker. And somebody else said, well, it's just memory. One thing leads to another. And she said, yes, that's the way it feels. It's the same kind of thing that goes on with everybody. Maybe that's what it is so sad about it. We could keep on doing it forever, she said. I read recently that, or rather, she read it to me. A scientist says now that thinking and remembering are the same. It's just a matter of timing. We thought they were different. Remembering, I guess, is supposed to be faster than thinking in a physiological sense. God, those guys are weird. Of course, they're the same. Everybody knows that. Try it for yourself. And even if thinking and remembering have the same thing happening in your brain, they seem different. That's important. But that's not the point. What's interesting is, and I learned this from reading the article, the synapse, you know what synapse is, right? is chemical. And I deduce this myself. Because the synapse, synapse is chemical, not electrical, not at the speed of light, there must be an ever so slight accumulated delay for every thought, and when you think how many times it has to happen in a day, for instance, in the billions, apparently, then the notion of the delay seems right. We would have evolved that way. The delay between, the delay is between what has formed as a thought, as is waiting in the wings, to use a phrase, to be played out in the mind next, as it were, and what is actually thought. Whatever it is that engages your mind totally, as in thinking while turning the double play at second base, or choosing which soap to buy, choosing among words and how to order them, Whatever it is that engages your mind totally causes you simply not to exist self-consciously. <laughs> At time of a kind, a kind, a kind of, a kind of whole in the time of who you are, the preformed thought is simply a cause next in order to do the active work of thinking. <laughs> in other words, thinking, as we understand it, is never, ever in real time, to use a phrase. When you think that you are thinking, aware of it, you are actually, I'm sorry, remembering. That's what remembering, with a different meaning, but there's no other word, a formulation, often of 
unimagined origins plan, I call it that, to be enacted in the synapses as soon as possible. You are carrying out a thought. <laughs> you call it a formulation because, I mean, the cause of the activity of thinking, a cause in the sense that it's functional, that you got just a moment or so ago, but it's still a formulation, remember? You could call it, whatever it is, to be thought a topology of sorts in the what's up next notion of ideas. And every idea would have a topology. Imagine a kind of two-dimensional form, a kind of blanket or membrane that spreads through your brain and across parts of your brain for just a moment or two, waiting its turn to be the next thought. This, of course, is sort of disheartening. I mean, I think the idea that we are never, or at least rarely, thinking in real time, on the other hand, maybe the crack, what is happening in the crack the seeming shadow falling across the brain <coughs> is truly thinking. And the rest is just remembering. I don't know. I live in that place, remembering. But I don't know. Some of you will understand what I'm talking about. You'll understand when I say to stay away from remembering. It's painful, it hurts, somewhere in your mind, or wherever things hurt. Stay away from remembering. Avoid remembering. I go to the other side <coughs> of the street when I see it coming. The crack, if that's where you feel the difference between thinking and remembering, the crack might set us apart in some way. It might be called what is called consciousness. And it could be, in another way, the physiological explanation of deja vu. In the 1960s, the once festival was indeed dramatic, but it wasn't the result of an asteroid bursting out of the sky onto the cultural landscape of Ann Arbor. Instead, the artistic weather forces moving in multiple directions from many sources converged in various times and places, new fertilizer on already moist soils. The creative energies of individuals often formed collective activities and resulted in a flowering of glamorous occasions. There, from 1961, the once festival began gathering its harvests. Grand food it was, but food grows best from local and surrounding areas. Here then was the potent culture, cultural agriculture of Ann Arbor. But the once era had many origins. The performance and creative arts energy was everywhere, including the activities of the bricks and mortar institutions within the University of Michigan. There were many outward looking and vigorous people, though often from arts and architecture, theater, film, creative writing, journalism, and the developing sciences. In that once era time, the physical interconnections between the university divisions included the music department, physically, it was somewhat spattered 
in old buildings around or not too distant from the central campus. Many of those spaces were not originally designed for the practicalities of moving musical instruments, lots of schlepping and good physical exercise. That scattered arrangement also ex assisted access to the other creative arts, such as those I've mentioned above. Thus, the composers and performers had real life experience of many diverse interconnections outside of their institutionally defined creative realms. Today, the music department has a more unified facility with far better bricks and mortar connections, but also further away from the general campus. And it still has performing musicians of exceptionally high quality as it did during the once era. <coughs> fertilized interactions. The primary support of the Once Festival and its related concerts and performance activities came mostly from the community supported by the Dramatic Arts Center, ticket sales, and occasional external <coughs> patrons. Not just money, but the hospitality, organizational, and promotional support of external contributors. The major creative sources of the once era activities included people from the other performance and creative arts. Besides their own creative specialties, they attracted interactions and collaborated with others. I name only a few here. They were notably important as catalysts for the once festival, but also for their substantial influences on the other performance arts way beyond Ann Arbor. From arts and architecture, Milton Cohen developed a unique space projection theater art for surrounding space venues. By 1957, he had invited other collaborators, the architect Harold Borkin, Robert Ashley, and me. The two of us, the three of us, collaborated in developing musical innovations with both acoustical and electronic resources. <coughs> Milton Cohen's project had several names, most prominent, the Space Theater. Performances were underway by the late 1950s and continued into late 1964 when the group performed at the Venezia Biennale in Italy. That was the same year that Robert Rauschenberg in, at the same Biennale in Italy <clears throat> got that big international prize. We return to Rauschenberg a bit later here. Interesting year. It was also the end of the space theater operations, but that's different. Milton Cohen's, uh, excuse me, another major figure was filmmaker George Manupelli. His name should be well known to this audience because of his establishing the now world famous Ann Arbor Film Festival. But that film festival actually began in the early Once Festivals. There, his films, with music by Robert Ashley, were initially shown. Later, Manupelli, Ashley, and I collaborated on the then prize-winning and now classic five short films, 1963. Its premiere uh, coincided with the 1963 Once Festival. During that same time, within the first three Once Festivals, innovative work <coughs> with film was being done by Donald Scavarda. Yes, composer Donald Scavarda. And some of it is part of this once more occasion. From the creative writing area, the poet Keith Waldrop was a nourishing figure. Those in the Ann Arbor milieu of creative writing and poetry certainly know his work. He just won a big book prize for poetry two or three years ago. Robert Ashley has a classic composition that uses one of Waldrop's texts. It has been issued on many recordings. An additional comment here. You may notice that some of the once era creative artists worked in a multiplicity of means, film and music, music theater and the like. Also, of those remarkable individuals, they were collaborative innovators. 
they, co they were able to collaborate, not always smoothly, but the end, end destination was what kept it all going. Following the first Once Festival in 1961, there was a vigorous growth of multimedia activity, not only within the Ann Arbor milieu, but with some of the invited participants, naming just one here, the Judson Dance Theater from New York City. The cross influences between the Once group, that's a lot of the people that were involved with the Once Festival, and the Judson Dance Theater were very substantial. Some of the <coughs> dance choreographer virtuosos from that ensemble created their own music. The visual artist Robert Rauschenberg created his own choreography. That group performed on two Once Festivals, 1964 and the Once Again Festival in September of 1965. Not too many of you would have been there. That was on the roof of the parking structure. <clears throat> to this day, I can't clear my mind of the extraordinary occasion when in Rauschenberg's choreographic thing with all those other artists, coming up from the lower level to the top with this large, collection of turtles, nearly a hundred turtles, crawling up right into the audience, which was seated all through the performance area anyway. Elephants are sometimes brought onto the opera stage, etc., horses and the like, depending on the great history, but not nearly a hundred turtles crawling right into the audience. I don't remember what they sounded like. A similar relationship <coughs> flourished between the once era people and the pioneering work of the San Francisco Tape Music Center people. We performed each other's music and some of their extraordinary creative artists performed in the Ann Arbor once era events. Perhaps because we had only minor constraints of bricks and mortar, the academically defined boundaries between the various arts and their separations had become irrelevant. And it is significant that nearly all of the once era creative artists were active performers with an understanding of ensemble responsibilities and respect of interactions. Not always smoothly, but then families have their <coughs> bang, bang. In closing here, I return to my previous analogies of the landscape and particularly the milieu of the Great Lakes State with or without skates, skis, canoes, or power boats. The Ann Arbor community and its individual took all sorts of risks with their ideas and creations and its individuals uh, uh, creations and they were usually too busy to confront the comments of naysayers. But the risks and mistakes were and can still be invigorating and nourishing of further inspiration. Taking risks Taking risks. There is an early and now classic theater music composition, now classic theater music composition of Robert Ashley performing with a recorded accompaniment. It is an early part of what I call his great Americana series of vocal musical theater compositions. It has a stunning beginning, just words a sentence from a mundane Detroit area radio advertisement, simple but loaded with energizing implications when placed in larger contexts beyond Ashley's composition. For me, it has echoes of all the work, risks, parties, and, in, and achievements of the once era. 
uh-oh, we're in deep trouble. Two miles from shore and no bottle opener. Beer opener. <laughs> beer opener. Beer opener, absolutely. Not any old bottle. Beer, beer opener. opener. Two miles from shore and no beer opener. That's, that's what I meant. Thank you. <laughs> Bottle open, stupid. Did you mention? That's okay, honey. I got the boat. I got the dancing with what? A naked foot, a naked foot, and a black foot. I got the beer, and it's got a pop top opener. Not enough time. Open the box. Pour the beer. That's right. I left out the later words, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the libretto can go on all the way to the end of the opera when the fat lady sings. I had to tighten it up here. Yeah, little. right. But I'm sorry I blew it about the, the bottle and the beer. That's okay. The beer was really important. Okay. It wasn't very good beer. That's, that's okay. They had to advertise in Detroit. It couldn't have been very good beer. That's okay. But it that's was okay. a beer the beer opener that's problem. That's okay. Right. If, if, it's got, if it doesn't have a mistake, it's no good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, are we ready? Yeah. <laughs> Passage four, once more, Ann Arbor, 3rd, November, 2010. Encounters. In the fall of 1959, I attended an event on Manhattan's Lower West Side. The program included Lamont Young's poem for tables, benches, and chairs. Office furniture was pushed around a tiled floor, causing the intended metallic screeches, rattles, and scrapes. John Cage was a performer. After the program, I introduced myself, and he was unexpectedly welcoming. Invited Attention. me, in fact, to come with him for the weekend to the Story Point It was 1968. Where he lived outside we were in Tokyo, New York City. Plotting Crosstalk Intermedia, a festival was, until then, the largest avant-garde event ever mounted. 10,000 people came. The next morning, we got in his Volkswagen bus and headed out of the city. The On the way, I asked him, citing a recent Time magazine an article illustrated by a photograph of Merce Cunningham was assaulting the, the strings of a piano with a frozen Anything fish, that might happen how any later it felt to be so grievously uh, misunderstood by the press. He smiled and allowed that there were advantages to keeping the corks in the bottle. Robert Ashley. The strategic value of flamboyant misrepresentation and mysterious resistance because had not yet we were doing it ourselves. Absent the composer's customary collaboration. In Stony Point, Sal and Bob shared a conviction that the individual performers and John worked throughout the day as I did at floor level tables. He was quietly dedicated to the task at hand. His devotion to the principle of successfully realizing was unmistakable. He did whatever it was that he was doing as well as he knew how and welcomed the company of others who did the same. Ocarina. And a full-scale production of his theater piece Back in that morning. I promoted Japanese the idea of John coming to perform with the Cunningham Dance Company. Their visit brought about two revelations. Chorus of Arriving falls. early at the Ann Arbor High School gymnasium for a rehearsal, I heard David Tudor playing Debussy Etudes, music I knew from recordings by the sorts of issues that Ashley's work games. entailed. David was equally incomparable in different ways. Some of Mercer's music was on tape and included sonically frail but electrifying passages of Conlon Nanchero's studies for player piano. The inseparability of creation and realization was palpable. One Inherent thing in leads his design to several others. Customized to his own performing capacities, at first on the piano and French horn, later on string instruments with bow arm coordinate sleeves. Even the Argentine bandoneon 
origins. His music not only required... After Christoph Penderecki left his position at Yale University, they invited guest composers to teach a few years for a later, semester at a time. How this happened it was a roiling environment. Today. The School of Music is decisively separate from the music department, which is dedicated to scholarship about music, independent of even hostile to the actual making of music. Jacob Druckmann was a shrewd judge of talent and assembled a fine set of young graduate composers. That morning thing was I was there in the mid-80s when Michael Doherty, Aaron Kernis, David Lang, Michael Gordon, and Scott Lindroff were all in his group. He was worried that the production had become too obvious. Across the entire stage front was a floor to prepared me for Doherty. This guy is good. He says, he can write in any style you might want. Doherty's a big man from an Iowa Overhead farming family with four sons. Dozens of Over six feet five inches, speakers. he describes himself as Most of the, the smallest of the clan. At our first lesson, he was cordial, explained what his dissertation was to be on Ives and transcendentalism, and sat down at the piano. What kind of music do you like? He improvised in a startlingly wide variety of musical idioms. After listening, to a situation I told him in which the I intended to place a rock in his path, in one large enough so that he would have to work around it. Action and sonic in addition to private lessons, I taught two seminars. They were Still. animated. The individual meetings were agreeable but intense, and with trips to the Metro Liner back and forth in New York, the semester yeah. passed quickly. Yeah. During my final yeah. seminar yeah. meeting, such a I, that that it didn't I was not that we looking be forward to cleaning up my rented apartment. It was an we could offhanded do remark. After class, Michael came up and said that he would be available to help me. I didn't know what to say. Offered to pay him something. No, 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 he said, glad to do it. On the target Saturday morning, he arrived and involved himself thoroughly with my unwelcome obligations. Floor scrubbing, oven cleaning, and so on. Where one comes from matters. Concision. I remember everyone's astonishment at hearing that Donald Scavarda had written a set of pieces groups for piano that lasted less than a minute, the whole set. I got the score. It was precise, meticulous, eloquent. As pianist, Ashley invested in the music, and his sforzandos were executed with an intensity that suggested a finger could embed itself inextricably into the key, bringing the performance to ruin. It was something about how Don regarded time Intersections. In the early 80s, and the ways Gordon in which he required was on the faculty of the University of California, commit. Santa Cruz. Everything was now. A similar experience occurred with John Morgan's performance of Scabarda's Matrix for clarinet. It was not about sudden, even terrifying, shifts in the level of administered intensity or the fleetness of the fingers. It wasn't that kind of space. It was the perilousness of its revelation. He brought gallons. Morgan's corporeal engagement was so necessary. No incidental showmanship. Each sound entailed a preparatory phase of the utmost concentration. It began. How would it At evolve? Could it continue? Sounds for 11 seemed another world entirely, what had a communally interactive work with which the musicians had to listen to the evolving context, each deploying his or her contribution in ways not previously imagined, so far as I'm aware, not then, not yet. The sounds were unexpected, Composite miracles, one after another. I worked with Don on producing a catalog of the once composer's music. And I he, about so it was a project that he had suggested he was exacting. Both he talked me into becoming the agent of realization, in fact, a performer. 
responsible for producing a precise handwritten text with pen and ink. I look at these lines of cursive on the printed page and feel thoughts. the strain still. Illustration. Getting it right. No errant stroke. Service to an implacable vision that was not negotiable. Gordon came in the front door unannounced. Silence. We were our sipping and munching. And Wesleyan conversing. University Press's announcement he of the publication of Cajun Silence was momentous. I set it up. Fixing Young on composers then were focused on attached. changing the world. There were microphones they had too, and I think small earpieces. But when I got my copy, I consumed it virtually without we getting up from the table. Serendipitously, Cage was coming photos. to Ann Arbor. It was After December of 1961, minutes, and I arranged to interview him. The when the transcript of our interaction was published in C.F. Peter's A John Cage Catalog, he generously entitled it Interview with Roger Reynolds. As Robert Ashley had a reliable microphone and tape recording cell, I asked to hold the interview in his living room. I prepared carefully. Cage began the session by asking if I had actually read the entire book. Assured so, he remarked, candidly it seemed, that he had not expected anyone would. A good start. In that moment, perhaps because of the book, he saw the value of being clear and was. Bob was present and asked whether he could insert a question. He said, it seems to me that the most radical redefinition of music would be one that defines music without reference to sound. John was unsettled. He asked a few clarifying questions and then did what any politician would, shift the subject to ground he felt more comfortable on. It was a precious moment. Watching this master of invention, indirection, provocation, evasion, and inversion, unnerved by a younger generation, by someone already building out from his provocations into a space he had not anticipated. 